So good uh, afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. In Ukrainian crisis, Ukrainian crisis media center, uh, we uh, have this geopolitical dialogue, the format that draws your attention. And we talk not only and not just about some current events, international politics. We also discuss about discuss the vision, the perspective, uh, the scenarios, and we try. We try, well, not to make forecasts, but at least to give some assessment for those factors affecting the situation. In UCMC, today we have Oleg Shamshur, Ambassador Extraordinary in Planet Potentiary of Ukraine to USA in 2005-2010 and to France 2014-2020. Ukraine's representative in UNESCO and also the U.S. Atlantic Council senior researcher. So, today I'd like to start with the following, okay? Not to just stretch, uh, stretch it too far. So, we had a very tough night. We had uh, some heavy shelling. Kiev was shelled with missiles and still... Uh, they can't tell us what type of missiles that was, but uh, yeah, we know that that was quite a serious thing and that's a serious escalation from Russia's side. Uh, it's not the first case, but we've uh, had already that type of missiles used for shelling. So it tells us that Russia is still is entering 2024 uh, with a specific attitude we can't wait for any peaceful initiative so i will start not with the us not with france even because yeah i would like to talk about france as well and europe in general so i'd actually like first to talk about russia so recently in ukraine uh, we've had so many discussions on if the country is ready to have this prolonged warfare if you'll have the international support for how long will be that support how for how long they will provide it not even the experts have that discussion so um and we are pretty sure that all those messages we have from russia from moscow that they are ready to uh fight us for years everything's good with the economy and they'll be able to uh actually when the West, so they create this image as we take as objective, yeah? So I have the, the following question. So do you think that this image, that everything's good in Russia, is it actually realistic, the, the whole narrative? And um, is Russia isolated, not isolated, in, in international dimension, international institutions, bilateral relations? And what can happen in this specific aspect? So. Still a question, yeah? Uh, not a forecast, but the factors. If this Rus this narrative of Russia, if their opinion that they want to take part in warfare for a long time, will it be supported by the key political stakeholders and players which are fueling the strategy like China and other countries? First of all, I'm grateful for invitation and uh, this format itself of uh, geopolitical dialogue. This is this is a very good idea, an interesting one, and I do fully support it. So again, uh, thank you so much, and I'll try to answer your question. If uh, I don't forget all the elements, please remind me if I do. Okay, so first of all, first of all, of course, uh, it's really, really hard to give an objective assessment, um, being an external player. So I can assess only from the standpoint of, well, analyzing the information that I get from Russia, let's say, yeah, as an external observer. In general, I think that now in uh, Ukrainian-Russian war, now we're coming through, we've experiencing before that we had too. But this is the third watershed moment, I can call it. And Biden is right. Uh, which decisions will be made and uh, how will we leave that situation? So what the decisions will be and what the specific actions will be, these will shape the strategic situation. 
mostly. So, speaking of Russia, well, uh, taking into consideration what we see, its economy, Russian economy is suffering from sanctions, is affected by sanctions, but we have to understand that those sanctions, the majority of sanctions uh, works for the long-term perspective, yeah? But we have to admit and recognize that Russian economy is overcoming that. It, it's still functioning. So mm, one of the elements that is really crucial for us is, again, take. we have to check the, the sanction regime that we've established, yeah? Analyze it. Two things to mention. Of course, the first one is uh, further pressure, putting further pressure on Russia, uh, making it more strict and harsh, but also uh, what is crucial, the need, the need to eliminate those loopholes that we have in this regime, yes? And still we have to be very honest and sincere. On the one hand, these loopholes emerged because... A certain extent that was an innovation yes for the first time such a comprehensive sanction regime was established and it was the first time when Russia was uh, the subject and uh, it was hard to forecast everything but we also have to recognize that some loopholes are just intentionally placed there let's say yeah um, we can say that here we have this Greed as typical human feature. So economic players, political players don't want to lose something. Okay, so we have to uh, understand that it's there. This is the first conclusion that we can make out of that situation that we have today. So secondly, the, the military capacity and military potential of Russia. At initial stage, we've seen mm, this, this complete non-readiness and failure, but we have to recognize that Russia uh, is still uh, still had some lessons learned out of this, yeah? They, uh, and based on conclusions of experts and our military leaders, we, we can see a different Russian army now, but, 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 in my opinion, we don't have to fall into despair, okay, and become fatalists. So, There is no uh, alternative for Russia's radical military failure, let's say, yeah? Complete military failure. So it's still there that polarized approach, the good and the evil. And any uh, chance for Russia to breathe in, uh, as we had it in 19th and 20th centuries, uh, it's another chance for Russia to just hit again. So <clears throat> all these uh, interwar periods. So there's a wave of pessimistic and depressive publications. On the one hand, these reflect the reality itself, mostly the reality that we have today. And sometimes when I hear this, when I read this, I think, well, the problem is clear. It would be <clears throat> interesting It'd be interesting to read what we can do to solve the problem. <laughs> and uh, my favorite object of observation is the UNSG. All the time he's telling Putin that uh, what NATO won't do, what he heard from Obama. So uh, it's the problem of communication and uh, mobilization of our partners, like what should be done now, that the super efforts should be taken. It it may be hard to absorb, you know, and digest, but they have to understand, yes, maybe they have to sacrifice in order to um, give us, let's say, more benefit, I mean, for Ukrainian partners. So when it comes to diplomatic environment that Russia is in. We definitely can see that um, its diplomatic isolation is growing, but still we have to be very realistic. Uh, the struggle 
for what they call global south, it's just the start of that struggle, just the start of that fight, you know, rivalry. And our efforts, uh, we need to take more efforts, and it's really necessary. We have to talk more. We have to explain more. But at the same time, we have to clearly uh, recognize that for us to be sure that we can uh, drag the global self to us, and they're like sitting on a pole, you know, and just watching us. They're like fans on the stadium watching what's happening. So it's not just about appealing to some high principles. Maybe some of them don't realize those principles, but uh, they try to tell it like it's not about principles and strategy. Many countries say we have to feed our people, you know, in the countries. And I do think that it's something that Ukraine should be concerned with, but also the partners. They have to offer some alternatives to those projects uh, promoted by China, let's say, and the Biden's initiative. The big infrastructure project is, um, it goes in that direction. The direction that uh, is uh, really the best one for us to uh, interact with Global South. Saying that Russia is left by the majority of players of Global South, left alone, well, it's not like it is it's not real we can see if we take the case of uh, israeli war with hamas how can it happen so the axis of evil it's not just a theory it's not just something like taken out of thin air this is a real thing you know formally in this axis uh there are not so many players and components, but these exist. These are powerful, like Iran. And it's clear that it would never exist without the support of China. China is trying to uh, pretend to be a respectable player in international relations, but in fact, it supports Russia and it supports the actions of the axis of evil uh, to undermine the democratic world's uh action so not just not to get confused uh the russia's issue okay so uh speaking of its message yeah russian message that everything's okay we're doing even better we're standing strong as they say yeah for russia it's beneficial it's i'd say it's the only option uh it's the only option for their propaganda and ideological background that is accepted by putin he will speak of that even if the situation is radically aggravated, he'll still talk about it. Again, just uh, to draw the line under it. Yes, situation is complicated for um, Ukrainian and partners and allies. But at the same time, I would not say that we have to be very... Uh, fatalistic about it and overly pessimistic so it's not the best approach there are certain things that we have to do that are obligatory for us we should really do it to bring this positive dynamics back to the democratic powers to the the axis of uh, light let's say yeah thank you so much thank you and i i, I think that we agree that the picture that Rush is drawing, the image it's it's giving, it's not complying, let's say, fully with the actual state. So in Western media and in the national environment, maybe economists, uh, I can see uh, some pictures, some ideas that's totally different from the announcements made officially by Russia. Initially, when the full-scale invasion started, they had this financial backup, let's say, that they've been accumulating for years. And uh, the head of Central Bank of Russia, Nabibulina, they did everything they could do. They did their best to uh, ensure the stability of financial system back then. But this financial backup is almost like, has almost vanished. So, uh, it's almost empty. So in 2024, we'll see the, the 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 serious first serious manifestations of Russia's financial instability. 
they won't be able to continuously fund the needs and to support the occupation and uh, at least 400,000 of occupiers, you know, this whole army cannot be supported with it and will be supported. And uh, internal Russia social agreement, oh, that would be a hard thing, you know, that when they try to explain to their people inside that we're doing everything externally that you want to, but here in Russia, you just, uh, you take the money and you go to war. Basically, this situation is not that stable as it used to be. But at the same time, I do agree with you, uh, Mr. Shamshur, that there is not enough. Still, the sanction pressure is not that hard. The question, what can the EU do, and I mean the Europe, politically, economically, to reinforce uh, the pressure in Russia? Well, it's... Uh, uh, quite obvious. Uh, we've all noticed the sanction issue has is constantly discussed. It's, it's under discussion all the time. Now they are preparing another sanction package. And by the way, coming back to my previous words uh, about the lack of wish that, that some don't want to uh, forget about the financial interests, the uh, the Russian diamonds export prohibition or import prohibition, it, it's clear. Belgium can actually handle this. Yeah, you know, you know the situation. Yeah, I had, I know, I know, I had um, some conversations. People tried to convince me that we will not support it. This is not our initiative. If uh, there is a decision, if there is a decision, we'll start complying with it. But we can see that situation looks differently, or at least like it's mostly different. So, it's an example. If there is a wish, it can be done. You know, the most important thing is is the energy. Yeah, the energy sector. It's it's crucial. We have to limit them even more, limit the capacity of Russia to export its energy uh, sources and um, minimizing the capacity for Russia's military industry to get the components, the accessories, uh, the spare parts to produce ammo. And uh, during the last summit, uh, where China and the EU took part. So this this was mentioned, by the way, by the European party at the summit. And uh, they mentioned 13 Chinese companies which support Russia and help Russia to get these components and accessories to produce ammo and weapons. So we understand that Russia, uh, like Iran or Russia, like, let's say, those countries which compose the axis of evil or support it, uh, the activity of companies, regardless of the state impact, so without certain decisions made by state institutions, it's impossible. So the state is impacting this still. Uh, this, this is an important question. We have to reinforce the regime. Some steps are done for that. But again, I stress on that. It's, it's, it's a watershed moment. And, and this, this moment requires radical solutions and decisions. Even if these are painful for uh, many countries of the European Union, without this, we can't break the spine uh, of Russia's military machine. We cannot do it. And I just want to tell you again. So, if we take, uh, if we try to understand what we need to do when it comes to military assistance, what should be done? Uh, significant increase of weapon production for Ukraine to cover its needs. It it works, it's relevant for Europe and for the US both. But if we do see that some European producers say no, first we uh, complete our contracts with other states and then we will provide the weapons for Ukraine, well, I can't say what we ha what we can do with this. There's something still to work with, and uh, there is an understanding, at least uh, we know where this has to be done. But it has to be done. We, we It's almost, almost two years already, and uh, we only have the talks. 
we finally need to take these decisions. So yeah, this is a very good conclusion. And Jose Borrell uh, mentioned about that. But uh, with these calls and statements, uh, When Europe realized and when our neighbors understood the neighboring states, I mean, the Hungary and Slovakia, they understood that war uh, is ge geographically limited. Yes, it, it's taking place basically in our territory. The intention of Putin was to move as far as he could through Moldova to NATO states. That was the intention. Second thing, it was mentioned so many times in 2014, they could reach even the Baltic states. They, they could actually uh, invade. At least this is something that NATO representatives told me later, yeah? That um, Russia had very intense plans on the table in paper and only the weakness, institutional weakness, uh, and uh, this political pause, the unstable situation that we had, it gave a signal to Putin back then. They tried to annex the Crimea, and uh, the history could have been different, you know? It could have... In Ukraine, maybe we could have had the discussions that we should help provide military assistance externally. These would be hard discussions, okay, but still. Um, uh, their perception of war as of something distant and far from their borders, we're in a complicated situation. We cannot use this leverage. We don't have options. We have to defend our territory. That's the, like, so far there's still, it's the only option and uh, it's destroying the country even more than the aggression of Putin. So it destroys the capacity for future development. I mean, the occupation and when we lose the territories. But this this position of uh, neighboring countries, which changed in Poland, we've seen that. But now maybe they will try to balance it because uh, we have more pro-European, Eurocentric government coming, led by Donald Tusk, but still. We can see, like, everyone is calming down, the war is not coming to their borders, but I will say something I mentioned previously so many times. This ostrich policy of NATO, as I call it, so when they were closing their eyes, sitting blindfolded, they never saw these uh, clashes of aircraft in their space. So I, I faced these things. Well, they were stopping me at CNN, you know, uh, they were telling me not to touch upon that issue, the Russian and NATO aircraft clashing, and yeah. So it, it happened, you, just the missiles that were falling, but more serious clashes there were, initially in March, April last year. And this wish to close eyes and uh, not to respond, it, uh, it, it, it has to make us more sober when we assess the intentions and readiness but still from the uh on the other hand this is a this is the time when we s need to understand that despite well apart from the safety issues and security issues which is important which are important economic and political interests are different and uh, a very bright manifestation uh when we speak of this uh ukraine slovakian and ukrainian polish warming relations and political competition and some corporate economic interests are mixing all that in that kettle so what it leads to ukraine that ensures the security you can't measure it with money you know if i say this um I, i'm pretty sure that they say we have to say thank you to everyone and not mentioning anything i'm sorry but if we have a price of aircraft like millions it may cost like a big one okay it's expensive i can assure you that life of ukrainian warrior of our defender is not the cost of life is not lower because these people are giving their lives measuring it with aircrafts or uh mlrs or whatever artillery weapon you know you can't 
even compare it to our highly motivated and super professional defenders. So in Europe, there are not so many countries who can uh, provide a million of army. A million of servicemen, yeah. I don't think that this can be done by France, okay? A million. Or Germany. Spain. Italy. Maybe uh, this is about time for us, finally, where we have to think of our European policy. Whom we need to approach? We've always were directing ourselves, at, as they say, directing ourselves at advocates of Ukraine in Europe. Polish said this. Uh, this was a political motto. Slovak people said that. I remember this. And now when we start knocking uh, at the doors, it, it appears to be that they are trying to push the, 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 the feet. Yeah, but uh, in this gap. So they will talk nice, but that's it. The Mexican migrants, for example, those who are coming to the U.S., they bring their relatives there, legitimize themselves, and then vote for Republicans instantly because they are there, like they have entered the U.S., they don't care. So the same thing, uh, that's like maybe now, especially in the context that the next year the Europe par European Parliament uh, elections will take place and uh, many, many other things, we have to deepen the relations with Central European countries, okay, Western Europeans, okay, in our system of coordinates. First of all, Germany and France. I mean that with Britain, we have a very separate case. Uh, yeah, especially recently in the security sector. But France, uh, quite often it was mentioned, uh, Macron had many meetings, political meetings, the military dimension as well. France started supplying, by the way, MLRS to Ukraine. Yeah. Um, Germany... Uh, is staying far behind politically and France was demonstrating its specific opinion regardless of the US. Uh, Germany was fully in the Washington lane, let's say, then there were some changes and now Germany definitely is far beyond France when it comes to military assistance provided to Ukrainian political statements. Scholz like transformed completely if we compare Scholz a year ago and now. These are two different people. France is still staying in the shadow. We can't see it now. So what's happening with France? Uh, because it's natural that the ambassador is observing the situation, of course. And uh, what do you think about this idea maybe we need now to reorient and to try to approach Germany, France, and Brussels at maximum level as the EU center, I mean, Brussels. And this mechanism to be used to minimize those risks from Hungary that's blocking everything, Orban is blocking everything now, yeah? The in EU integration process and even those manifestations we can see we've had in Poland and Slovakia. Maybe this is a mechanism that will help us. I'd like to start with the following. I'd like to give a couple more of words uh, of what we mentioned before the block. Now it's a hard moment that we have in um, when I speak about the perception of war in Ukraine by the US and Europe. If 2022, it was the, the start of aggression, full scale mission, it was shock. It was the state of shock. And if we take the social opinions, 60, 70 more, 60, 70 percent of people, they supported Ukraine and they really. Um, were ready to provide assistance to Ukraine when they realized that Ukraine was ready to withstand. But uh, now, in 2022, uh, they started doing this, but now they have finally this fatigue, war fatigue as we call it, they express it. People realize that it will take a long time, you know, and now the leaders, European leaders, and leaders of other states supporting us, now they understand that they have to be leaders. They have to explain 
to their people, to their countries, why it's necessary to support Ukraine and why it's necessary to stay with us till the very end. And um, speaking of uh, the European dimension in our foreign policy, I do think that now we have to concentrate on the most important issue. Do everything that we can to uh, for these negotiations to start and we have to understand like it doesn't matter how horrible the Orban's statements are it, it doesn't matter how horrible the attitude of and disgusting the attitude of Slovak leaders but EU accession and negotiations on EU integration it's about Compromise. We have to reach compromise and consensus. Even that type of compromise that is not objectively beneficial or some compromise that pushes us and forces us to make some decisions which are quite harsh. First, this is the first part. So I do stand for it. We have to concentrate on negotiations. This is really important for us to mm, set the course to your integration to establish the foundation for that course okay now when it comes to support of uh, support of you states provided to us to ukraine so uh yeah the attitude to ukraine we have to recognize is the attitudes changed but it changed in 2022 when it was pretty clear to europeans even those uh who uh really wanted to uh, really thought that we could negotiate for, for Russia somehow, who didn't want to isolate Putin. But now they realize that this is a threat for Europe as well. The attitude changed to Ukraine. But if we take uh, the states, which can be, which can become the advocates of Ukraine, the circle is not expanding that seriously, I can tell you. It's, it's honest. It's an honest answer. And I do think that uh, I would call Baltic states, despite all the problems, up and downs, as we call the recent ones that we've had with Poland, of course, well, still Poland is in the circle, maybe Scandinavian countries. Great Britain, yeah, but Great Britain is, let's say, beyond the EU as they decided to be. So, yeah, of course, it's Great Britain. There... Their opinion was not a surprising one, but the determination and uh, the audacity of this policy in positive sense, that was a good, not, that was not a good, a, 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 a nice surprise for me, but that's, this was something I expected to get. With other states, well, um, we have to work with them as well. And uh, it's pretty clear that we have to forget about other things. We have to concentrate on uh, the military component. Security, yeah, security component. At the same time, it's really important to talk about Ukraine's recovery and it's, uh, well, I've had these recent conversations with Americans. Mm, we have to send a signal that uh, this is going to be an open process open for everyone and especially we have well we have to be very cautious and careful uh when we engage states to our recovery those states um, beyond the anti-putin coalition we have to be very careful with it let's say republicans heard uh, that in that process uh, china will be actively engaged that China will even be given some preferences. I don't believe this. I don't believe this, but that narrative is being promoted now. So we have to clearly state that this this is going to be fully transparent and open, and open for everyone, first of all, for those who support us. Maybe this will be a political decision, uh, but we this decision is necessary. The attitude to Ukraine, if we take the strategy, and if... Uh, if we take this as a long-term strategy, if we speak about Germany, France, this will not be sustainable. It will not be functional and it will not be solid without big business. 
and uh, mid business and small business like French German businesses they have to enter Ukraine still for it only when we have economic interests arising let's say this would be a serious stimulus a big stimulus to support Ukraine and to support its interests in uh, the European dimension what we can see in Poland yes what we can observe I uh, I, I hope it won't even aggravate in Slova Slovakia when uh, they block uh, the border. So this is just the, the, the very, very first, the, the, the early bird. These are the early birds, as we can see. We can see the Moscow hand there, especially the Polish blockage. It's, it's pushed by Moscow hands. But this is just the very first signal to us that how hard the negotiations will be on EU accession, yeah? This will be a harsh process, and uh, this will be harsh in economic in uh, dimension first. If we speak about France, I heard that before the war, when I worked in Paris, um, we are the competitors. Like in, in farming sector, in uh, grain production, whatever. So this is... The European agricultural policy at least uh, the recent one the policy the policy's intention was to calm down French people and to give some positive signal to farmers to French farmers for us this is a challenge and we have to find uh, some ways to outreach French uh, people and other players in European economic environment where Ukraine would be really to make Ukraine interesting for them and for us to be ready to for us to be ready to negotiate and to look for some joint solutions the last thing I just want to mention truly um, <coughs> our relations with the Europeans with European states will depend on our uh, post-war condition if we leave this war not only stronger in military dimension i mean if we continue walking with reforms walking the future with the reforms if our partners see that we strengthen the institutions if we strengthen the democracy this will be a different conversation if again again we give uh them another reason to get these uh accusations orban it was kind of quite a grotesque thing to hear about corruption from him and he and his friends <laughs> well uh, were accused uh, had some serious accusations on uh, the funds abuse but if we give any reason for suspicions you know our negotiations our integration path would be a harder one and I even think that if uh, well if we finally get the victory together with our partners I mean if we do win if we take away the strategic tension if we get rid of it the institutional uh, dimension and economic dimension this will come to the fore uh, these will be even more serious and it will be harder to solve those problems I fully agree I fully agree European integration currently is on the one hand uh, may uh, transform from purely political process to technological instrumental process it may turn into one and the negotiation stage yes we speak uh, of this and in a couple of days the eu will decide if the negotiation stage is open or not shall it be open or not so these political decisions these political decisions uh, many things depend on that and it will be a completely different process starting from this stage European integration that takes not even two years as uh, Ukrainian Prime Minister Shmihal is telling us prior to accession it take it will take years and years but a new answer is there uh, currently as I think we can uh, become a part of EU only uh, under their conditions that, that's what I told you, yeah. They will dictate how this should be done. But not only because of the process itself, the negotiation process, and uh, not even the politicians understand this, Ukrainian politicians, it stipulates... Well, you can't, you can't actually... Uh, 
Yeah, it's not a buffet when you just take whatever you want from the table and something you don't want to take from the table. It doesn't work like this, okay? It's not a breakfast in the hotel. So you have to accept everything that you're given. That's how it works. And I just want us finally to have this kind of mentality that EU requirements are not just a check box, okay? Um, not just another step. 99% of these reforms are necessary for us, regardless of whether we are in the EU or not. But not to Ukrainian power, not to ruling politicians, unfortunately. Unfortunately, not to them. And it happens so often in our history that um, pro-European movement gave uh, a chance to uh, move in the democratic direction just for the country to develop. Yes, it helped us a lot, but there's another side of the truth. Uh, before we get this access to European funds, to the market, like fully, hundreds of millions, yes, so before we do that, for many years, we still will, uh, if the country actually mentally, if the country mentally mm, overcomes that, you know, if we manage to meet those requirements, this is, this is something that we'll have to face. All those recovery funds, yes, there will be a huge competition for it. Some already starts, like Polish, already have insults. I heard from Polish, like, oh, we started helping you initially. We have to be, like, the, the first. Americans did it as they usually do. They've uh, appointing their leader in where it's less than 500 billion. She previously even uh, refused from the state uh, positions like the Ministry of Trade. So I think this amount that will be taken from the frozen assets plus additional money. So it's huge recovery funds. It's, it'll be just a part of the investment. So in this aspect. None of that would happen fast. None of that would uh, be scaled up, including your integration, in my opinion, or active movement to comply with the chapters of negotiations. I'm just uh, running ahead a little bit. I do hope that the political decision will be made. And uh, then this routine hard work, and of course, without the resources, it will be just frozen. And it will get stuck without the security if there is no understanding um, how Ukraine is actually secured and protected. This is, this is the most important thing today. It seems to me that we've recently been looking a lot about the front line, yeah, observing it a lot and not speaking enough about the EU mechanisms. Russia's blackmailing that they had in 2021, in the very end, you know, of 2021 for uh, us, to move to 1996, for NATO to move to 1996 uh, structure, you know, to move to 1996 NATO capacity, it's it it sounded like ultimatum, you know, a harsh one, and not acceptance of the ultimatum has become the preparation of to this military clash. But not with NATO, because they were ultimating NATO. And they were blackmailing NATO, but they're fighting us, not NATO. We understand that Putin is uh, acting like uh, a hooligan in the, you know, in the dark street corner, trying to abandon. Yeah, I I'd say, yeah, that's uh, a member of some gang who's trying to hit you with a knife. Not even a hooligan. Yeah, that's, that's a different thing. So, but... Uh, it was the initial approach. It's 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 purely like okay, I will hit the weak one, like uh, a gang member. I will hit the weak one, and this is a cynical, a, a horrible thing, you know, horrible approach. But what we have in the very end, so Ukraine is still not protected. Let us imagine, in a perfect option, the deoccupation of territories, uh, the borders, 1991 borders, and then. 
there is an issue that comes to the fore, something that we hear from official representatives of the big states. Russia can uh, recover in a couple of years and attack not even Ukraine, maybe, because, uh, well, it's obvious. If there is the occupation, they will think twice or three times if, again, they have to enter Ukraine. Maybe they'll move elsewhere, like they entered Kazakhstan. Yeah, it was like the government request, um, sort of, where they have the training, uh where they transported the uh where they deployed with aircraft their military if they wanted to wanted to what they wanted to use in ukraine but they couldn't so they may attack another country and they realize it but at the same time the process of discussing the model the security model the post the occupation the post occupation security model it's 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 like moving so far it's not on the priority list there is a discussion of some projects, uh, documents, so-called security guarantees. They're, they're, they're so-called <laughs> to that extent that the draft of protocol uh, prepared uh, in Kiev, the Makfol Yermak group showed it, the word guarantee was there, but then it vanished. And now this whole thing looks like uh, just an empty, just a blank paper because from what I know, as they told me, uh, in, in France they don't have even the specific figures, the governmental decision. In the best case, just to freeze the situation that we have now, just to supply the ammo and weapons. And when the U.S. says with Biden's mouth, like, we'll give you everything you need, but the Congress just blocks this and it's over. And they think that when we even send a bilateral agreement, the Congress automatically do it. But Israel, Israel with that kind of agreement, but still no money. Yes, they spoke of Israeli option to provide security guarantees, but we can see Israel, M and A. And again, they raised that something we don't need. Yeah, absolutely. But again, they raised the issue, and I can tell you, maybe, well, you know it, in Washington, uh, instead of invitation to NATO, they will invent something. They'll give something. They'll give us something. So it's a serious issue. Let's be frank. The probability for Ukraine to be invited at Washington summit is quite low. The political invitation, especially after Joseph Biden answered the question, and a good question of Ukrainian reporter, Ukrainian Forum representative in Washington, at a big press conference of presidents, like, will there be a decision on uh, Ukraine's invitation to NATO or not? And this decision, by the way, that was also always raised by two presidents, American and Ukrainian, and always uh, uh, irritated Joseph Biden that Zelensky is too determined. And uh, when it's impossible, it like changes the opinion. I remember this. And uh, and some books describing the situation is that at some meetings, uh, presidential meetings, the Ukraine's position was quite weird. So first, uh, insisting and demanding to be to access the NATO, uh, very aggressive from Ukrainian leadership, and then suddenly, like we start doubting in NATO's capacity. Like it's like a swing, mood swing, as they call it. So now there is a question. These conditions, when we do see that political decision is an invitation, is moving further from us. The so-called guarantees, security guarantees, in the format of freezing the situation, this will maybe just deepen the relations, but will definitely not give us guarantees, per se. What is the security model? For me, a security model is like collective defense, of course, like NATO, what we have now, because the... Do, do you remember that uh, Western European Union that vanished because there was no US in it? So what do we need to do? Because it's obvious, without the understanding, like how can we close ourselves and protect ourselves? Russia will attempt. Uh, 
we'll have these attempts again, and we'll try again, at least, while well, Putin is here. Uh, NATO, bilateral agreements with nuclear states, yeah. But the reality. What do we need to do, like, in 2024? So, a complicated question. If I knew the answer, I would not be sitting here, I guess. Just what I want to mention. First of all, I agree with you fully, as, and I mentioned it before. The key question, the key issue is security. I've been at one uh, conference. Uh, a German politician gave a speech, and he said a very good thing, that for Ukraine, this is about recovery as well. If Ukraine is safe, if Ukraine is secured, if peaceful development is guaranteed, then, of course... There will be a flow of money from private investors, especially. This will be an important element in the process of recovery. If uh, there are any doubts, and this won't happen then, there'll, it will be a different scale, and I would say uh, a different model. So it's a first thing. Thank God, uh, after 2022, the West understands that it's not about the undermining uh, of EU security framework by Russia. The security architecture is completely destroyed. What we can't see with OSCE, it's just... Uh, it's just zero. It's just a zero. This, the system is obsolete. It's it's It has to be transformed. We have to build something new instead of it. And I stick to that opinion that basically the policy uh, regarding the Western policy for Russia, it's a policy of, um, it's a new appeasement policy at some point. But again, um, what we have to build, what new thing do we have to build? I'm just, uh, excuse me for interrupting. We have to understand that we need, oh, the, I'm not ready to give a specific, clear answer, but we have also to be ready to create some security mechanisms without Russia, at least until Russia becomes more or less normal, and this is for decades. Creating something new. So we have this initiative, uh, British-Polish-Ukrainian initiative. Ministry of Foreign Affairs spoke of that. Previously, Baltic, Danube, Black Sea, when it comes to security. Maybe we shouldn't wait before the political decision of NATO is there, but we need to start joining some NATO countries, separate ones. It's like this biological supplement, uh, I don't know, to medicines. It may be, it may give some benefit, but it cannot give the treatment as it should give. It's just a supplement, you know? The additive, I mean. Coming back to your question, well, first of all, we have to be realistic. It's clear uh, that those agreements discussed now, these are... Um, these are not guarantees. These are just agreements. This is to increase our capacity, Ukrainian capacity, military capacity, and to withstand the new wave of aggression from Russia, but even uh, so, the G7 statement in Vilnius, yes, on um, on the bilateral agreements, it's like there is a framework. It's even a problem now for these agreements to fully comply with. to these uh, benchmarks that were set in the statement. Again, it confirms that these agreements will be important, but its importance and its uh, benefit will be limited. The only guarantee is becoming a part of NATO. But now we can see this accession is impossible without support from the US. Unfortunately, now we don't uh, see the support. It's not there. And I do think that situation may change. Um, in that case, when we have radical military failure of Russia. But um, 
it's clear for everyone now this is not it's not going to happen tomorrow it will take certain time for that to happen so what should we do now i guess uh, strengthening our defense capacity using i guess those tools that we have and uh, if uh, we have to be realistic. There is no other option. Which other options can be there? I offer an option. Signing uh, a defense and security agreement with the United Kingdom, Baltic States, and Poland. This, this, as, as it's a supplement that you buy to complement your treatment, but it, it's not a solution. All these are NATO states, okay? And uh, they will not act differently or act uh, in controversy to native principles, but this global problem is still there. Until Ukraine becomes a NATO uh, member, the problem cannot be solved. It's it, it brings us back to the vision of the end game in this war. So if we see it as the destruction of Russia's capacity to be an aggressor, to intimidate the neighbors and to terrorize the neighbors and to act destructively in European and global dimension. This is one thing. But if we think that Russia can be pushed away or even uh, even if Ukraine enters the NATO, it's uh, Or some special format, but it's a stupid idea. So we again come to this vicious circle. Okay. Okay, not with these like partial formats. The idea of previous uh, SG Rasmussen that we can use, uh, we can uh, take the whole country politically NATO, but f Article Fifth will cover only only those territories which are not occupied um it's sort of creative thinking which is not functional which is not efficient it's not viable i don't believe even uh, i don't believe that there will be uh, in nato enough of support for that idea I have serious doubt about it. So let's imagine that that happens. And um, you can truly, can truly believe that Article 5 shall cover uh, the territory if, if Putin continues the aggression. For example, reaching the right bank of Dnipro, it will never happen. Well, um, it's not that simple. We have this practice in the EU, for example. Cyprus, the northern part of it is... Well, Cyprus is fully entering it, but only the part of it is a full member of all uh, the EU uh, quiz. So this is just, uh, it's just an example, not in the security matter. So Ukraine still protects the right bank. So we're, we're, we're trying to push Russians away. If NATO knows that this is guaranteed, it's the same thing. But there is another issue. If uh, they... Uh, it's my second question. Regardless of the model, by the way, it was previously mentioned, but it wasn't perceived uh, neither in Ukraine nor externally. So, a second question. What General Milley said. In Senate, he was asked how to get to negotiations with Russia, what we need for it. He said, we need the U.S. to step into the war. Well, maybe he said that just to cut all uh, the other questions, but cut off all the other questions. But Theoretically, is there is there a chance for uh, someone to stand shoulder to shoulder, not just to give us assistance, but to enter the war, step into the war? If we had this uh, ally agreement, you know, or if we had that chance, okay? Do you see that option where it's 100% off? So coming back... Uh, 
Coming back to a la Rasmussen models, well, again, I just want to underline that this idea, it's not even like unreal, completely unreal, it's counter counterproductive. And um, it will give nothing to Ukraine. Speaking of the support, if we take the NATO policy, the key players policy anti of anti-Putin coalition, it was aimed or directed at localizing the war within Ukrainian borders. Therefore, it's hard for me to imagine um, how other states, first of all, the states, NATO states, shall support Ukraine in the struggle by deploying the forces. Maybe this will happen only when Russian aggression uh, uh, will reach the NATO states. But I don't want to speak of it. I didn't want to speak of it. But again, we have, as, uh, as my friend said, a diplomat. So we have to read documents till the very last letter. We have to check how the Article 5 is formulated, which is not automatic. Okay, um, we spoke of guarantees, security guarantees for the so-called security guarantees for Israel. How it uh, the, the formulation itself. If we go back to NATO, how that if we want to use the mechanism, it's not just enough to say it's Biden, that we will protect every inch and defend every inch of the territory of NATO uh, states. But to do it, literally do it and be ready to do it. So we need those mechanisms, at least those which may be put in action, the full membership in NATO. Now, um, what we get and what, what we will get in Washington, I don't think this is something that we will be expecting to get. What we have to expect, the clear formulation and uh, start of uh, Ukraine's accession into NATO, if informally, then invitation, the only real option is during the war, we have to transform the whole uh, defense sector and reforming the army in future and uh, the country must uh, live in this security and defense dimension this we all it will require efforts from all of us but this is necessary we will have to militarize let's say because i don't believe that the radical failure of Military failure of Russia, I, we have to hope that this will become a stimulus. It will, it will trigger, yeah, it will trigger, a good word. It will, it will become a trigger, and it will trigger the processes inside the Russia, destructive ones, but will, will it become a trigger, actually? Will it lead eventually to changes in uh, Russian leadership? And even if these changes are positive, well, I'm not pretty sure about this. So in any case, Ukraine have to be ready to defend itself because um, at least for our generations, uh, well, I don't think this threat will vanish. Well, we're still alive. Okay. Okay, we still have to mention the U.S. Just to finish with these statements. Um, I've heard uh, some fresh assessments from various parties why um, we couldn't reach the military victory, the fast victory, like in 2023. In 2024, we'll uh, correct. So... Um, I'll ask you directly. My impression is that if uh, the U.S. are ready to use other approaches, meaning 200 atoms, yeah, 
uh, aircraft to be provided and pilots or trained. So this is a different approach, totally different approach compared to 2023. Okay, so this gradual supply and regulating the escalation, let's call it like it. So if this regulation of escalation has changed to max support possible, I, I understand that uh, not enough of ammo is maybe produced, but in Europe, then uh, they still have to pay a lot of attention to it. When Pistorius, all the countries should do that, and the US as well. And there's a certain time. Can Joseph Biden uh, make our joint victory uh, his pre electoral motto, let's say? And the second question. Republicans, especially those uh, backed by Trump. So they will attack the opponents, political opponents, with not enough support provided to Ukraine. Or they will try to ensure that the support to Ukraine fails from the current administration. Well, first of all, it's obvious that... Uh, well, we have to understand that everything that is happening in the U.S. around uh, support to Ukraine and its continuation, the key dimension is internal policy in that process. A positive decision made by Congress, in my opinion, is impossible if there is no compromise with uh, in, in migrational policy and reform of migrational legislation, is it possible to have that compromise? Well, uh, this attack is there, the more of political blood, uh, Republicans smell, they put more pressure. So I handled the migration issues. It's, it's a hard thing to handle. You cannot solve it instantly but republicans decided that now taking into account the interest of administration to uh endorse the strategic support session the strategic support pa package it's the moment for them to push it forward for democrats it's hard because this is related to migrants and their um families and uh children there are different Mexicans, of course. They vote for different parties, but it's important for Biden, you know? The compromise is a hard thing for both parties, I can say. But it's possible still. The most important thing is that recently Biden has given a signal that he is ready to make a step, take a step back. What is aggravating? The opinion of House of Representatives is even stricter when it comes to migration. They have this uh, loud um, and quite a strong, impactful, uh, radical group. And Johnson is in that group, by the way. This is quite a loud group. And everything will turn around this. If you noticed uh, the procedural uh, decision that opened a way to at least the debates to provide support to Ukraine and Senate, all Republicans voted, including those who stand f for support of Ukraine, like Mitch McConnell, yeah? Why they changed the rhetorics? Well, because uh, in this case, they put interest of their party They put the interests uh, they somehow tried to integrate support to Ukraine into strategic dimension and strategic uh, interests of the US. This is like a political struggle and they want to hit Biden as hard as they can. And now there's a conversation to open the impeachment process plus uh, Another accusation is against Hunter Biden, California. It's announced like for a uh, tax evasion. So, um, in fact, this uh, 
opposition, the struggle is getting stronger. And uh, Trump is there again as an impact factor. The Trump is controlling the whole Republican Party, basically. So I would say that this looks really complicated and confusing. But I think that at least in Senate, there is a compromise. It, it's possible, at least. Will the Biden make the Ukrainian support as his pre-electoral uh, motto? Yeah. Uh, obviously, he won't, but support Ukraine if it's continued. And if the dynamics, uh, military dynamics, is different, it will give him more grounds to say that his policy was correct. And I think uh, that he will not recognize that there were some uh, um, errors. So he's interested in successful Ukraine and prospering Ukraine. He wants to continue uh, provision of the support. Why it is important for this decision to be made now? If, and obviously it won't be made. By the end of this week, we still have a couple of days. It's the last working week, let's say, uh, in the Congress. And then they uh, restart in January 8th or 9th. So in mid-January, they have uh, the first primaries in Iowa. And um, this will be covered uh, with the electoral campaign and... Uh, Republicans' opinion and uh, statements are shaped by the attitude of Republican voters, okay? Mm. It's 50-50 now, based on some uh, surveys, even lower, maybe they are supporting uh, Ukraine at this level, like 50-50. Half, approximately, thinks that U.S. is doing a lot. So, again, it's a vicious circle. On the one hand, legislators take into account the interests, not the interests, but uh, moods of the voters and uh, their statements and actions against further support Ukraine are strengthening the mood. So the situation is quite complicated in general, that's what I think, and I can say that not even complicated, but uh, mm, quite tense. Uh, if they're ready to catch the flag and be the leaders. So it's a question again. So we have to be realistic and prepare for very complicated 2024. Just not to finish with uh, this tension and anxiety mm, and pessimism. And again, we say that the next year is going to be the year that determines everything. I don't know if it's going to happen. Mm, but we definitely can say that this is going to be maybe after 2022 when uh, we ha it was the most critical year when the invasion started. 2024 will set the foundation for, I guess, even a decade. In my opinion, to continue this full-scale war despite these weird statements that we're gonna like push it to the end with russia and uh, the russia won't just withstand it you know not only ukraine but the western partners are not handling with that type of tension yeah and fatigue and exhaustion i think the rhetorics will change soon and i do hope that this rhetorics uh this rhetorics will not include the statement that ukraine must give up. And Zelensky gave a good answer to Biden at press conference. Pretty, pretty clear for people. But in any case, the scenarios that you've mentioned, scenarios we've discussed, nobody knows what scenario will actually be there. Another thing we did mention today, Ukrainian internal capacity, institutional political capacity, the readiness to mobilize, but this is a separate thing. Without this, of course, external plans, war plans are useless. So it depends on internal, um, what we feel internally as Ukrainians. It depends on our leadership and our army. And of course, the uh, mentality and the 
mental condition. We all live in a complicated situation and social dimension that's going to be hard. Uh, despite all that, the state that can still live and develop like this during the war, the full-scale war, um, it has a huge potential anyway. And I do hope that At some stage of historical development, all these, uh, all our great efforts will give us a breakthrough in future. Because uh, how we endure the war, and what we withstand, it's incomparable, even the wars that we've seen. Vietnam, Korea in the 20th, 20th century, it's, it's, it's a different approach, it's a different thing. Yeah, we criticize leadership, they make mistakes. The 2014, yeah, but it could have been worse, much worse. So we'll be grateful to our partners, but uh, we'll really hope that they will uh, start. They'll shift from short-term planning to strategic visions. I hope that they will have Ukraine in the strategic vision, but not out. Because if we are out the security framework, it's not going to give us something good. Not just Ukraine, but we speak of Moldova. Should be in the system. I think Belarus in future should be there when they change the regime, of course. But this is a topic for another discussion. Thank you so much for very specific answers. I think that no forecast should be made, but yeah, it's quite a typical thing to have in the end of the year. Uh, it's a case when all forecasts uh, are in our hands. We are responsible for it. Thank you for the invitation, and uh, I really uh, want us to continue with these dialogues. It's an interesting thing. I also think that we have to finish it positively. We have to win. And I'm pretty sure that Ukraine can become a powerful player in a global dimension. You can't have an efficient security system in Europe without Ukraine. And uh, economically, we should be there as well, so we have to win. Thank you so much. Thank you for attention and uh